Hi, all. Uh, next, we're going to hear about uh, rendering for virtual reality in Poland. And about that is going to talk Ville Kiviste, the CEO and uh, tech coder of Minefield Games. Welcome, Ville. So, hello, everyone. Nice to see you here. So, in the next 40 minutes, we will talk about rendering for virtual reality, um, especially in Poland, which is a game optimized for VR. Um, so we will use Poland as an example of how we have dealt with problems and re requirements when it comes to rendering games for VR. So let's move on. Um, about the outline, first I will give some background about uh, me and our game. Uh, after that, we will look what it really means when we talk about rendering for VR. Um, what are the unique identifiers and, and differences when it comes to rendering for VR? And then we will go through some uh, best practices when it comes to post-processing. It differs a bit about traditional rendering. Um, I'll bring up some points regarding parallax mapping, which works really well, and we will uh, talk why it works so well. Um, let's talk a bit about ray marching, because, well, this is a demo scene event, and we use ray marching in our game, and it actually scales quite well to ER, so let's see why. Um, and lastly, I will give some insight into how we have dealt with anti-aliasing, which is a quite problem, problematic issue in VR. Um, and hopefully we have some time for QA in the end. So let's start with me. I'm Ville Kivista, CEO and tech coder at Minefield Games. Uh, fellow demo seniors might know me as Pomak of uh, MFX. Been doing some cooler demos as well. Um, and Mindfield Games is quite young uh, gaming startup based here in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, we were founded in 2013, and we are a VR-focused gaming company. Uh, currently, we have 10 people. Um, of most are actually in a production team. And uh, Poland is our first game, and it's coming for PC and PS4 next year. Uh, we also have some mobile VR productions, but they are still on our unannounced, so I can't go more into detail with them. So you probably don't know Poland that well. Anyone knows Poland? Oh, I was wrong. <laughs> well, nice that <laughs> so many people know about it. But well, anyway, it's good to go um, have a short in introduction about Poland. So um, Poland is a first-person sci-fi exploration game set on um, uh, Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Um, the gameplay is a bit like, um, um, you can compare it to games like Myst and Gone Home, uh, but it's definitely unique gameplay experience. Um, it's optimized for VR, meaning that we, uh, we really want the game to be experienced with Oculus or HTC Vive or Morpheus or uh, OSVR headsets, whatever. Unfortunately, not Gear VR. It doesn't really run that well on mobile. Um, so our, our aim is to make a definitive first-person ex experience for VR devices. Um, quite many games are seated experiences. They work really well in VR and they are cool, but we want to do a first-person experience. So you're actually um, free to move around in the world as you wish. Um, we, we like to call Poland as an AAA indie game, meaning that our budget and, um, and game scale and scope are quite indie, meaning that it's um, small and focused on the actual gameplay. But when it comes to visuals, we really try to aim for the AAA quality. Um, we use Unity 5. We used to use Unity 4, but then 5 came, so we updated that. Uh, we use PBR rendering and um, the new GI system. Everything, all, all the lighting in the game is real time. We don't have any static light maps or anything because, well, for quite many reasons. But it's cool. Um, next, we could see some screenshots. You might have seen these or not. Anyway, they are actual unedited screenshots straight from the game, even though it's 
Uh, the game is still under construction, so they don't represent the final quality in any way. Yay, we have a hydroponics. Then we have some strange sci-fi things, you know, game is sci-fi the uh, themed. And then even more sci-fi things going on. I think we could have a short look about the actual gameplay. I will show just a short section of, of, of um, what the exploration gameplay actually is. So player is able to find a Polaroid camera with uh, dual lenses. So actually you can take pictures with the camera and when you do, you actually get a 3D picture because you have two lenses and with Oculus you actually can see the 3D stereo image. So you can place objects on the tables how cool is that? Or open a fridge. Pick up boxes. You can turn knobs, press buttons. So awesome. Then you can try to take a picture. Try to remember what's the correct button and not drop the camera, but instead take the picture. Yeah, it's really, really interesting and fun, as you can see. So, just try to imagine that with Oculus, you're able to interact with the world in any way you wish. Oh, it's in full screen, just a second. Either, yeah. Okay, so what it really means, um, what, what rendering for VR really means? Well, first, we have two cameras, so, can, um, so we can render the view for both eyes. Uh, the cameras have also uh, unusually large field of view compared to traditional uh, flat screen games. Uh, the field of view is, you know, can be over 100, which is quite a lot. Uh, the refresh rate is very high. Um, Whereas in console games, you can actually target 30 frames per second. In VR, you actually need to hit 90, and that's your minimum frame rate, not average. And that's because if you don't hit the 90 hertz, players will definitely see the drop in frame rate, and it will actually um, destroy the illusion of presence, and it's really something you should avoid. And it's good to keep in mind that we're not um, show, oops, sorry wrong button. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're not actually showing the world to the player, but we're actually putting the player into the world. So, um, in traditional games, you have effects like uh, depth of field and, and loads of bloom and everything. It actually can destroy the presence quite a lot, and that's something you should really avoid in uh, VR rendering. Um, and yeah, then the pixels, they actually are very large when you measure the ang angular area that they take on your uh, field of view. So that means a that a single pixel can, have, um, can look really, really bad, especially when it comes to specular aliasing. It's really horrible, and that's something you really should avoid. And um, yeah, if you, if you are using you know, like PBR uh, material textures, you really need to take care how you filter and uh, sample your um, specular maps and so forth, normal maps. And um, yeah, we have two cameras. So basically that means, um, in theory, double the draw calls, which is quite horrible. 
Um, but luckily, we have DX12, Mantle, and all the other new uh, graphics APIs, which will help with the overhead when it comes to draw calls. So there's some help in the near future. Um, but rendering for um, uh, render with two cameras is an excellent showcase for SLI GPUs because the latest drivers can actually make the other GPU render the left eye and the other GPU the right. So basically you can get a single GPU performance from two GPUs. So that's a big win-win. Um, but however, uh, despite the two cameras, one aspect remains the same, and that's the resolution. Uh, because the displays are just your traditional mobile phone displays, uh, the resolution is actually a bit higher than a normal desktop resolution, but anyway, the pixel count is the same because the screen is divided, at least at this point, uh, between uh, eyes. So this actually means that post-process effects don't have the same overhead as, for example, rendering meshes twice. And so high refresh rate that causes some problems. Because uh, you can see, yeah, when you calculate how many pixels you need to fill per second, you soon notice that the amount is, you know, many times that of uh, 30 hertz uh, 4K screen, which is a lot. So you either need a very beefy hardware or simple visuals to render that many pixels. Um, to keep the game accessible to as many players as possible, uh, you should um, you should make as many graphical options as optional as possible so that players can uh, customize the visuals so that they can run it even if their hardware isn't the latest top-notch hardware. But there are some, actually some good things <laughs> for uh, high, high frame rate requirements. Um, it, it means that we have lots of temporal data available for us. Um, the temporal data is really good even because the movement of, of your head is really, really minimal, uh, like sub-millimeter. So that means that your temporal data is very local and, and it's very good to be used, for example, to analyze or to even uh, upscale the resolution. Because if your frame rate is really low, then your uh, camera can move a lot. Um, um, when in much, much bigger steps, and, and the data isn't as valid as it, as it is when, when you have uh, smaller movements. And about the post-processing effects, uh, which work and which don't. So remember, in VR, the player sees the world through eyes, not through camera. So eyes don't have depth of field in a way. You just focus your vision. So don't try to imitate a nice movie with depth of field in VR. It just doesn't look good. Um, you can use blurring for some kind of effects, but depth of field is just, you know, don't do it. Um, then screen space, real-time reflections, they are rather nice, but I, th I think it's like cancer of this generation. It, it has more worse cases than good cases. So uh, the upsides are too little to, you know, actually make it possible to use SSRR. Um, something don't ever, ever try to do lens flares. Have, you probably don't see lens flares without glasses, so don't try to make your eyes see lens flares. It's not a good idea. And if you try to put some filmic noise, maybe to um, make it look a bit sharper or uh, or a higher resolution. It just looks that you have an overlay in front of you and doesn't work that well. Because you really can see uh, the lack of depth in, in overlay images or in some post-process effects, so don't try noise. But yeah, luckily Bloom can wor work actually quite well and you should use it um, a little, but just don't overdo it because then it can look really, really horrible but that actually applies to traditional games as well. And something which you, which you actually can do uh, is SSAO. It really makes the world feel, um, well, have more depth. 
you know how SSAO looks. And it actually works in VR. Just try to keep your um, radius a bit lower so that you don't get uh, artifacts or anything like that. And yeah, definitely don't, don't um, show any noise patterns. They look bad. And yeah, then about parallax mapping. What makes it so special for VR? Well, naturally, it's, um, this is subject to game type. But whenever there is something that player can see from close range, uh, the flattiness of, of traditional textures, even bump map textures, is very obvious and something which, which the player can see. Um, so the, basically, the downside is that the player can easily get a feeling that the world around uh, her is in a real virtual world, but just a um, pile of props. So instead of making the world feel more real, it can make it feel more fake. But if you're making a game that's set on a theater stage, then I mean, that's, don't use parallax mapping, please. Um, and yeah, also increasing the model detail is very easy because you can just tell artists to put more detail. So, <laughs> but yeah, in practice, it's not that good because then they will, will just uh, put more vertices and faces and then your frame rate will go, well, not in a good direction. But yeah, with parallax mapping, the vertex count and um, triangle count stays the same. All, because every, all the work is done in pixel shader. All we need to submit to, uh, to a shader is just one additional height map which usually actually can be even, you know, like ambient occlusion map. So it necessarily doesn't even take more memory or anything or more texture channels. Um, and also because you basically can get height map for free with modern uh, PBR texturing tools. It's something you, sh you just should do. And what's good in parallax mapping is that it's really, really easy to uh, just set off. If players don't have a hardware that's um, capable for parallax mapping, like um, performance-wise, then you can just disable it. And here's an example. So that, that's uh, just a normal bump map surface, which looks a bump map surface. And now you have parallax mapping there. So even though the example is quite, well, you can still see the difference. And in VR, you actually can feel it even more pronounced. Um, but there are problems in parallax mapping, uh, mainly the aliasing, because uh, POM aliases badly when, when, when it's further from the surface because it's missing the texture uh, anti-aliasing filtering. Uh, but luckily there's a simple solution which also helps with the performance, and that's uh, you can decrease the height of the surface uh, based on uh, distance to the camera. So close up you will get a proper parallax mapped uh, surface, but when the player moves further away, it transi transitions uh, smoothly to a just plain bump mapped surface. It helps with performance and it looks better. And actually, player even isn't able to uh, notice the, uh, the transition if you change your values properly. And then about ray marching. So that's very suitable for VR because it has very low polygonal overhead. Like usually, you can do ray marching even with a single tr uh, triangle. So that's like three vertices and one face. You can't get actually any less than that. And yeah, like I said before, the amount of pixels is about the same when rendering for VR. So ray marching effects are usually uh, fragment-based or compute shader-based effects. But anyway, they are uh, done per pixel, not per vertex or per face or anything. Um, The, there are good things. I mean, usually ray marching is, it can be quite heavy, depends how, uh, depends about your lookup functions and so forth. 
but the good thing is that you can actually do uh, per pixel LODing with ray modchers. Um, you can decrease the quality of ray modching when player is further away from the object, or you can actually even decrease the quality per pixel. Um, because in VR, the player views, um, player's eyes are focused usually in the quite middle of the screen. So when you have a ray modger effect, you can decrease the quality closer to the edges of the screen, and that will help with the performance, and the player doesn't notice any difference, actually. And you can also uh, upscale some, some ray modging effects quite easily. So if your modger is just too heavy, then just downscale it and upscale it. We'll have an example of that later on. So here's how we use uh, Ray Marcher in Pollen. So we have just a normal um, cube that we render. It's uh, filled with a Menger bulb fractal. Uh, Menger bulb is it's just a combination of uh, Menger sponge and Mandel bulb. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, the fractal is animated so that it looks more lively. Um, it's uh, eight vertices. 12 uh, triangles, so you can actually instance them quite easily. So, yeah, it's the polygonal overhead of rendering it twice isn't that much. Uh, the cube in our example is 50, 50 cubic meters. Um, I've had some tests where we have one cubic kilometer cube with uh, about one, one or two centimeter accuracy. Uh, we will probably have that in, in our final game, but, but not yet. Um, it's also really easy to integrate in your deferred pipeline, so you can get it lit completely with your point lights, spotlights, or whatever. And it's just really cool in VR, because it's something you're not able to experience in real world. And that's how it looks in the game. It's a bit hard to see from the picture, because it's missing a, a point of scale, but well, it's cool. Buy the game and you can see it. So, that was an example of, of, uh, um, of an op 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 opic uh, object. But we can just continue the marching. We don't need to hit when we hit the bounds and render just solid objects. So how about rendering fog volumes? Because for fogs, we just need a simple density function, whatever that is, just some nice noise function. And then for each fragment, we just do the normal ray marching operation. Um, nothing special in that. You can see loads of examples from internet, like from uh, IQ side has loads and lots of examples. So how we do it in Pollen, or use it? Here we have a full resolution uh, volume fog. It's uh, animated, fully volumetric, so that when it has density pockets and um, that sort of areas, the quality is really nice. It's, it really feels that you're, you're uh, moving in a volumetric environment. But there's one problem in that. Uh, rendering that takes 19.9 milliseconds on this laptop on some high resolution. So it's not actually, yeah, doesn't run on VR, in VR. Um, so what to do? Well, we could decrease the iteration count in the function, but then it would really hit, well, decrease the quality too much about the volumetric, func uh, volumetric function. Or we could decrease the distance, but player can actually see that really easily. So like I said earlier, we can just use the oldest trick from the book and uh, render it in lower resolution and then upscale it. So how does it look? Well, that's quite horrible. You can see the, yeah, when we decrease the resolution of our uh, screen buffer, as a side effect, our depth buffer is downscaled as well. So you can really see that when, when there are edges, like in the base antennas and, and uh, flying rocks, which are the black dots, uh, you can really see the lower resolution. Um, 
But I am currently proposed a method in GPU Gems 3 how to uh, upscale uh, low resolution particles using edge de detection. So we use we use the same trick. So first we have the low resolution uh, volume fog buffer, which you can see here. Then we do edge detection to high resolution buffer. And you can actually use any edge detection what um, algorithm what you wish, but we have, I think, uh, some Sobel here or something like that. It works quite well and it's quite fast. And uh, in the picture, the black pixels here tell us that there, those are the areas where we need higher resolution rendering. So here's, an, here's the edge buffer detection overlaid to a high resolution image. So the red areas are the lower resolution buffer and the brown areas are the result of high resolution buffer. So as you can see, uh, um, way over, the, over half of the image is red, meaning that for most parts of the image we use the lower resolution rendering. Here's the final combined resolution, and let's compare it. Uh, here's the full resolution 19.9 millisecond version, and here's the 7.4 millisecond version of uh, using the low, resol ro low resolution buffer. As you can see, the difference is pretty impossible to see. And the speed difference is quite huge. So let's move on to anti-aliasing. That's one of the biggest and basically most difficult areas of VR to tackle. Because, well, if you use MSAA, it's quite heavy. And, well, we use Unity with Deferred, so we, actually, it, we cannot even use that. Um, and, uh, yeah, because you have lots of, your head is constantly moving, doing all this micro movement. So if you have any, any specular aliasing, you will notice it. If you have two small edges, you will notice them because they will just crawl there. You can see, see lots of pixels popping. And, and remember that pixels are huge. So whenever you see a pixel popping, you really will notice it. But luckily, because the refresh rate is so fast, that means that we have lots of temporal data available from the previous frames. And what, what we can use that for is for temporal anti-aliasing. So how it works? The idea is that you keep last a frame or few in memory, and then you blend, blend it with a most recent frame by reprojecting the previous buffers so that you get the uh, positions from last frames matched to a position in your current frame. Um, then you can add some um, jitter to your uh, model view pro uh, projection so that you can um, actually jitter the image constantly so, and that way you can get sub-pixel sub accuracy which actually resembles really closely uh, to MSAA but with uh, just a fraction of cost because it's really, really cheap to do that blending and reprojection and everything. Um, and you can also combine it with other traditional post-process solutions like SMAA or even FXAA or anything, something, something AAA. It works really well. So here we have an example. Um, I'm not sure if the screen is large enough. Yeah, you can see some nasty itches there. So here's no AAA at all. And uh, here we have SMAA Resolve. Uh, you can see that, well, it fixes quite many edges, leaves some, some areas like the area close to the sink and um, something else. Um, but the problem is that when you move a bit, um, when your camera moves, you can see the anti-aliasing so, uh, Resolve uh, crawl as well. So, it, it doesn't look in motion as good as it looks in the still screenshot. But how it looks when we have a temporal component in it. 
you can see now that most of the edges are uh, smoothed out. It looks really, really good in motion. Apart if you have, you know, um, fast moving objects, uh, the result doesn't work for those that well, but it really doesn't matter because your eye isn't able to focus on them anyway. Let's compare it again. So here we have SMAA. This was the original, no AA at all. And uh, here's the final solution. So it works well. It's really, really cheap to do. And you just should use it if you're not able to, or if you can't afford MSAA, yeah, go for temporal. Um, they said I have about 15 minutes left, but I'm actually done here. I was uh, so nervous that I went through this really, really fast. But I think we have lots of time for QA, if anyone have, uh, has any questions. I'm happy to answer them. OK, if no one has questions, then it's time to give a round of applause to Ville. Thank you for your pre great presentation. And next, in a few minutes, we're going to have Andre Raff talking about open source, source virtual reality. So that in uh, oh, almost half an hour. <laughs>